Hi, uh, I thought today what we would do is maybe talk a little bit about the prayers of the people, uh, talk a little bit about what the prayers of the people are, and maybe talk a little bit about how we can do them well, uh, craft them, though, especially for those who are leading the prayers of the people in a, in a church. Um, so prayer is an intricate and high calling for the Christian. Um, there's lots of lots we could say about about prayer, and I really like how this one book talks about it. Um, this is this is a book that is if you're doing the prayers of the people a lot, if you're leading us in the prayers of the people a lot, um, this is a book that's worth getting. And I'll see if I can. So it's uh, shaping the prayers of the people: the art of intercession by Samuel Wells and Abigail. Cocher, Cocker. It's it's really well done, and uh, they, they it's a very good how-to manual, but also talks about the theology around prayer as well. And one of the quotes they have that's really helpful is: "To be in the presence of God is humanity's purpose and destiny. The name we give to consciousness of being in the presence of God is prayer." So that's what we're doing when we're praying. We're trying to be in consciously in the presence of God. Uh, there's lots we could say about prayer. The formula for prayer that is often used in the Book of Common Prayer is that we pray to the Father through the Son or in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a Trinitarian formula for prayer. But it's also important to say that prayer to any member of the Trinity is appropriate. I remember talking to someone one time where they felt like they were always praying to Jesus. And so they felt like maybe they were um, disrespecting the Father. <laughs> and I, the Holy Trinity has such a love and respect for one another that any to honor any of them is to honor all of them. Um, so I don't think we have to get too bound up in that. And there are times, especially, it, you know, when we think about we're being the season of Pentecost or uh, the day of Pentecost, it might be particularly appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit. But we also recognize that the it, w within the biblical witness that the Holy Spirit is often pointing us to, uh, to Jesus. And even the Father is often pointing us to Jesus. So prayer does have kind of a Jesus-centric uh, way about it in, in Christianity, um, even though Jesus does direct us to pray to the Father, our Father who art in heaven. Um, so there's lots we could talk about that. Um, and there's lots of different types of prayer. Um, we might talk about adoration, where we adore God. We might talk about thanksgiving, where we give thanks to God for different um, ways that he has been helpful to us. Um, then we might also pray in penitence, asking God for forgiveness and indeed, all the way through our liturgies, we find different kinds of, of prayers there. The prayers of the people are particularly and, and specifically intercession. Um, this book, again, has a good quote on intercession. So um, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, intercession is prayer in which praying people mediate between people in need and God who can answer their need. Intercession is the practice of coming before God in openness and honesty, during which we name our tenderest human need and our deepest hope for change and transformation in the expectation that God will confer a blessing. So in intercession, we are placing ourselves between those who are in need of God's blessing and God who is offering blessing. And God has called us to a place to, where we are to um, pray, we are to intercede, we are to come to God. God wants us to come and ask. Uh, and, and maybe that's a bit of a mystery. We don't always know why God wants that, but God wants some sort of participation on our part for the betterment of the world through our prayer. And we shouldn't uh, diminish that, that role at all. We are participating in what Christ is doing. Read that in the book of Hebrews, that 
Christ is interceding for humanity as his, in his role as the universal high priest in the heavenly temple in a sort of symbolic way of looking at it, that Jesus is continuously interceding for humanity. And we as the body of Christ uh, join in with Jesus in that prayer. It's a high calling of the church. Uh, and it's not, and this is probably the point where the church is most obviously not a way to escape the world because it's so obviously the world is uh, rushing in at us in the intercessions that we are not leaving the world behind, but we are um, approaching God on behalf of the world. I like what Alexander Schmemann says. He's a Eastern Orthodox theologian. He says, the church is not a society for escape from this world to taste the mystical bliss of eternity. Christ gave himself for the life of the world. The bread and the patent and the wine and the chalice are to remind us of the incarnation of the Son of God, of the cross and death. And thus, it is the very joy of the kingdom that makes us remember the world and pray for it. It is the very communion with the Holy Spirit that enables us to love the world with the love of Christ. So it's it's central to who we are as Christians, that we are incarnate. We are a part of this world and we ask for God's blessing upon it and we ask for God's grace to heal it. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of prayer either. D.L. Moody once said that every work of God can be traced to some kneeling form, which I like, that God wants us to call upon him and he wants us to participate in the betterment of the world. Um, and it's good for us to be praying for the world too, because God is full of compassion and mercy. And if we are loving humanity, if we are loving creation, then our hearts will be open in compassion and mercy for the world as well. So we are turned outward, out sort of unselfishly towards the world, concerned with the people who are making up the world and with the, the creation that God loves so much and, and uh, is so, um, it's God's work of art. And so we, we should take care uh, as stewards of that creation. And, and, and also for the, the people that make up the world, we should have compassion and mercy for those who make up this world as well and desire their healing. Uh, the prayers of the people are an ancient part of the liturgy. And Justin Martyr mentions it in 155 AD. Uh, he says it goes after the reading and after the homily. That's exactly where we put it and why we put it there, because it's an ancient tradition that at that point we bring the world's concerns to God, not in a way that God doesn't already know, but in a way that we ask because God desires us to ask. It's a, it's a liturgically appropriate place to put the prayers because we hear from God in the readings and um, even in the sermon, and then we respond to God. And we might talk about the Eucharist as then a further response from God to give us what we ultimately, our heart ultimately desires, which is this deep intimacy and healing with God, communion with God. So that's kind of very broad strokes, why we pray, especially why we intercede for people. But maybe it's worth talking a little bit about the mind and the heart of the one who is praying. Um, When we, when we lead the prayers of the people, our attitude coming into that moment is very important. We have to prepare for that. And I think one of the biggest problems when people lead the prayers of the people is that they forget who they're praying to. Uh, they're speaking to God. 
quite often prayers of the people can, and I, I don't think this is, anyone does this on purpose, uh, but because they're standing in front of the congregation, because they have a microphone and they're wanting the congregation to hear them, it's very easy to subtly start speaking to the congregation rather than speaking to God with the congregation overhearing. What you are doing in that moment is that you are representing the congregation and you're bringing prayers to God on their behalf. So in a sense, you want them to hear you, but you want them to hear, hear you so that they can say amen to what you're saying. They want, uh, you want your, your voice to be heard so that they can be in agreement with you as you're praying. But you're not praying to the congregation. And those who lead the prayers of the people, they know that, but it's so easy for it to turn into something you're saying for the people, not prayer to God. Uh, it's a very subtle thing that happens, but it's, it does happen. Um, let's see. So what, what we should do when we start leading the people is that we need to prepare ourselves appropriately for that moment. And probably the most important thing you can do when you're leading the prayers of the people is to have God in your mind's eye as you are praying. Imagine God in front of you. And if you need to get really literal with this, imagine God sitting on a throne in front of you and you are speaking to God in that moment. Uh, the way that we set things up liturgically is, is maybe partly why this is a problem. So the the lectern is for the people to hear God's word spoken to them through, through scripture. Uh, the pulpit is to hear God's word interpreted uh, through the person of the, the preacher, but also found within the word of God uh, spoken to the people. So both the lectern and the pulpit are both places where, in a sense, God is speaking to the people. And we take the prayers of the people, we often put those prayers to be spoken from the lectern, and that can cause confusion. A better liturgical place for it might be for the person to be in the midst of the people, like in the middle of the aisle, even facing the altar. And then it maybe feels a little more like I'm praying this on the behalf of these people towards God, towards the altar symbolically, right? Um, so that's maybe neither here nor there. Sometimes it's microphones and amplification are the reason we, we do that because it gets a little complicated, but it, it might actually be a better, uh, a better place for it because it, it might help people feel a little more like they are representing the people in their prayers rather than speaking to the people. But I think that is the, if there's nothing else you hear in this video, uh, hear this, that the, be, be really careful that when you are speaking in the prayers of the people, that you are praying to God, you're speaking directly to God rather than to the people. Um, and that the formula for prayer can be important that way as well. Sometimes we use what's called a bidding prayer. And the way that that works is, you know, we'll say, let us pray for and who's being addressed when we say, let us pray for, like we're, we're addressing the congregation in that. And if you're going to use that litany, then I would encourage you to leave lots of silence so that people can actually, between your biddings, insert prayer. Um, I think that's, that's probably really important. Um, there are other litanies that, that don't use that kind of a formula. And th that's the reason I kind of don't really like that formula uh, because it, it seems to incline us towards talking to the congregation rather than talking to God a little too much. Um, though you, we can use it well. So I'm not trying to say don't use it, but just beware, of, hear that caution, please. Um, we want to be speaking directly to God if we can, if we, as best as we can when we're, because that's what prayer is, right? Prayer is not um, speaking to the congregation. 
even though we want them to hear us. So we're speaking to God about the needs of the world, the needs of the people, um, rather than speaking to the people. Body posture. Be really aware of your body posture uh, and how that communicates. Uh, we hear lots of people talk about how you know, 80% of all communication is nonverbal. And that, that goes for prayer as well. So watch your tone of voice. Um, try not to be fumbling with paper too much. Try not to speak in a monotone. Uh, try not to look bored. Try not to have your hands in your pockets. Or um, All of that can affect how people are praying with you as a, the intercessor. We should strive for a sense of reverence, a sense of honesty, a sense of sincerity in our prayer. That will assist people. If we're distracting, then we get in the way of people's prayers. We should invite people into a prayer posture as well. Uh, so it has been kind of an ancient practice to, to kneel um, for supplication. And I know that that's hard for some people. Some people have bad knees and sometimes it's just you know tricky for people to use the, the kneeler and everything. Uh, so then you'll have some people sitting and some people kneeling. I do think that unity in this is a little bit it is uh, important as well because you can get in these awkward situations where some people want to stand and some people want to kneel. And if you get someone who's standing right in front of you, you're kind of looking at their rear end. Uh, and that can be distracting from prayer. So it, as much as possible, aim towards the congregation being in some sort of unity in the midst of the prayers. And so what I often say is please sit or kneel as we as we pray. Uh, I know it's it's not that other stances of prayer are wrong or anything. It's an ancient Jewish practice to, to stand up with your hands in the air um, for, for supplication. And I think that's perfectly okay, but just aim at unity in your congregation so that you don't sort of, um, individualism is fine, but you know, in the midst of the prayers of the people, I think sometimes that can be a little distracting. The prayers that you shape should be formed in the midst of silence. Uh, preparation is, is important too, that you take time to really hear what the Holy Spirit is guiding you to pray. So we pray as prompted by God. So we want to take time to, to hear how we're being drawn. Um, so take time to meditate, take time in silence, take time to pray about what to pray, and ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help you. I think that's really, really important to do. It shouldn't be, you know, once in a while, I know that we, we don't have time and so we can't prepare the way that we want to. And there are times where even I, uh, someone uh, didn't, we didn't have someone in place uh, at other churches that I've been at where we didn't have someone in place where they forgot to do, to do, um, to do the prayers. And so I got up in that moment and prayed and using a litany and yeah, so it's it you know it's it's things happen <laughs> ideally though this would be something that is prepared for uh quite purposefully uh, i think that you can do this well extemporaneously you can get up in front of people with very minimal notes and lead the people in prayer just speaking from your heart. And I think that that, if done really well, uh, is probably the best way to do it. Um, but most people don't feel that kind of confidence to be able to lead people that way. Uh, sometimes our, we don't feel like our prayer life is strong enough to be able to get up in that moment, to be able to um, pray with confidence. Um, sometimes we're, we feel like we're going to stumble over our words. And so we, we want to have 
something crafted in front of us that we can use. Um, and that's totally fine because sometimes when people, we do in our culture emphasize extemporaneity, extemporaneity in prayer as if it is something that is more genuine or, or something, you know, so if someone gets up spontaneously and prays, we sometimes value that more than someone who wrote it down, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, you know, someone gets up and starts praying and sometimes they'll use repetitive phrases or it won't be very coherent, uh, but they're not using any notes. <laughs> and then you, you compare that to someone who spent, you know, three days uh, praying about this, meditating on this, looking at the scripture readings and crafting something that is uh, like, how is that less genuine or, or less prayerful? So I, there's a little bit of prejudice within our culture right now towards extemporaneity that I think is a little bit unfair. I think well-written, prayed over prayers are very valuable and our culture maybe has to learn a little bit more about valuing that. Um, so anyway, that's, those are sort of side, side issues. But um, The other thing is that, maybe this is for the congregation members in general, is that praying is not a passive activity for the congregation. You're not meant to be thinking about your grocery list or digging through your purse or uh, you know, looking through the bulletin when, when the prayers of the people are going on. Your job as a congregation member, when the prayers of the people are going on, is are to, your job is to hear those prayers, to put your attention on God, and to allow your heart to be drawn into those intentions so that your energies are being added to the prayers that the leader is praying. So you have a job to do when those prayers are being offered. Um, it, it can be tempting to be doing other things, but uh, your job then is to be drawing your attention to God and to the intentions of these prayers. So the content of the prayers of the people, uh, there are different ways that you can look at this. The Anglican tradition is maybe to look at the uh, collect. Uh, collects are prayers that Anglicans use that bring about the theme of the day. And uh, we'll often have, every Sunday, we'll have a, a collect that's prayed that uh, is supposed to match the readings uh, as possible as that is. Um, so the first part of the collect, and there's not all collects follow this formula, but um, generally they do. So the first part of the collect is an address to God. So who is it that you're praying to? That's the answer to the first bit there. Um, what is God like? Uh, who, is, who, who are we talking to? So we might say something like Almighty God. Like that is, a, that is an address to God. It's in the vocative form. We're, we're addressing God. We're speaking to God. But there's also a descriptor as a, as a part there as well. Um, and we can explore a range of biblical ways of addressing God. God is addressed in lots and lots and lots of ways within Scripture. And we can use this time to explore some of those ways that we can address God. And you may want to match the address with the kinds of requests that you're making. So if we're praying for someone who, a family who has just lost a family member to death, uh, we might say, God of compassion um, as a way of addressing God or uh, God who comforts those who mourn. That can be a way to address God that matches the, the petitions that we're going to be making. Um, you may want to use familiar phrases or maybe even uh, you can use lines from a hymn to address God. That can be a creative way to address God as well. Um, so, uh, or 
so phrases from scripture, phrases from, from a hymn, that those can all be very appropriate ways of addressing God, as well as uh, using that kind of an image um, or a, a hymn to use that as, as a kind of a, a thread that can flow through the prayers and reoccur uh, over and over through the petitions and into the conclusion. The second part of a collect is to name the, the context. So why does the person praying have reason to trust in God? So an example might be, um, so the, the introduction, the address to God, Almighty God, and then the, the context might be to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. So we're, we're naming the context that we're in with God. Um, and often this has to do with a past action of God. So it might be God who, Almighty God, who released the prisoners from Egypt, released the slaves from Egypt. Uh, you're saying something about a theological truth about God, a scriptural truth about who God is, a character trait of God that gives you a basis for hope in the midst of, of approaching God in prayer. Um, you can look for images that are from the Sunday readings. So if you sit down, if you're writing the prayers of the people and you sit down with the Sunday readings, and you might maybe take a look at the, the hymns that have been chosen for that Sunday. You might also be looking at what the, the theme of the sermon is or which particular reading that the, the preacher is going to be focusing on. And once you have all that, uh, you can sit down and start thinking about the, the prayers um, and maybe there are themes from those scripture readings or the hymns or the sermon that are going to be bubbling up for you that might tie together all the prayers of the people. Like if, uh, if the reading was about people being in slavery in Egypt, Moses being born, then you might want to use those kinds of images uh, to draw together and tie together the, the prayers of the people. Uh, the third element are the actual petitions. So this is the main body of the prayers, and it answers the question, what do you want God to do? And here's where we need to be a little bit daring. Uh, dare to be imperative. <laughs> uh, Jesus told us to pray, give us today our daily bread. It's, it's a kind of a, there's a boldness in it that we're um, asking God and with a kind of boldness, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not shy about asking God for what, what we want, uh, what we're hoping for. Um, so we should come to him boldly. Uh, this is not a time for, to be inhibited. At what action do you want God to take? God is listening to these prayers and assume God is listening, not the congregation. Assume God is listening. How do you want God to change something? What is it you want God to change? Are you asking God to address human sin? Are you asking God to address uh, consequences of a natural disaster, the powers of evil in the world? What are you asking God to address? What problem are you asking God to address? And do this with honesty. And um, and there are things to be careful of here. Like we don't want this to become a time of social commentary necessarily, especially if it's going to be divisive and divide the congregation up. Um, be, be sensitive to where the congregation is. Um, you want to pray out of your own integrity, what you think is right and wrong, but you also want to pray in a way that's not going to be distracting for the congregation. And you want to respect the difference of opinion maybe that is in the, within the congregation as well. So the prayers of the people shouldn't be a time of division. It should be a time of unity as you approach, um, as you approach God. So 
you might have a particular political or social opinion on an issue, um, try to find where the unity is between uh, between you and maybe those in the congregation that you disagree with and uh, find that common ground and pray into that common ground. That can be a little more effective than using the prayers of the people as a bit of a, a way to rub people's noses in using your own opinions <laughs> on political issues. It's not the, not the time, you know. Um, An important part of the prayers is to bring to God people who are suffering, people who are suffering in body, people who are suffering in mind, people who are suffering in soul. Uh, invite people into silence to bring those people to God in prayer. And everyone in the congregation, they are all going to have people in their minds. And I think you should give a good chunk of time to silence in the prayers of the people. I would say even like 30 seconds. Like, and you could even count in your head while you're doing that. But leave a good chunk of silence that people can bring forward the people they're concerned about. They, they will also want to bring their own issues forward. There are The people in the pews are going to be suffering as well. And they might be suffering with things that they're not comfortable letting anyone know about yet. So um, they need time to bring their petition to God in the context of worship. Um, silently, maybe they're willing to name, name things out loud. And that's beautiful when you're in a congregation. You hear people naming all kinds of uh, issues that they're dealing with. And it's, it can be a bit of a cacophony, but it's also really beautiful to hear all these issues being brought forward. But we do want to leave time because some people are, maybe they just got a, a cancer diagnosis and they don't feel comfortable letting anyone know yet. If we leave silence, then that lets them in the silence of their hearts bring that, bring that concern to God in the midst of their, their worshiping brothers and sisters. And I think that's really important to do. Um, be careful about confidentiality when we are naming people in the prayers of the people as well. So if someone has come to you and they let you know that they just got, say, a cancer diagnosis, maybe they haven't made that public yet. And if you say, uh, and we pray for... John, who was just diagnosed with cancer, yeah, that person may have been uh, not prepared for that to be made public. So be really careful about what you make public uh, in the midst of, of prayers. And be careful about divulging things that could turn into gossip as well. So we want to be really careful about, about that. Um, let's see. This is this one's a little bit tricky, this piece. There can sometimes be long lists of names that people have asked us to pray for. And that can get a little tricky because sometimes the names will, are not people that we know. And that can be hard for people to know how to attach their will to and sometimes they don't even want to tell us what's going on. So we might just have a name, a name of a person we don't know. We don't know what their illness is. And that can be really hard for people to try to connect with in the midst of the prayers. Um, we can trust that other people in the congregation do know these issues. But it is, it is a tricky thing to, to try to navigate. As a rule, we want to try to update those lists as much as we can. And we want to have as much detail as the other person is comfortable so that we know how to uh, address those those needs. But we want to avoid having like a long list of names that we um, it can almost read out like a phone book. And uh, it's really hard for people to maybe connect when, when that's how the, the prayers of the people are being used. And I know that's really tricky to try to navigate, but um, it, just just be aware that that's a, that's a can be a bit of an issue. Um, and people can get quite offended if we try to take names off that people want 
on, but try to find ways that refresh that list so that we are constantly being updated as to how people are doing. Um, you don't want someone, maybe someone uh, a year ago asked for someone's name put on the list. And um, sometimes if we don't have a way to get that name off the list, and if no one knows that person or how it got on the list or a person who's connected to that, then we have no way of following up. So um, for all we know, that person has died and, we don't, and we're still praying for them. So we do need a way of updating those lists and keeping them fresh. Don't be too afraid of silence. I know I mentioned silence, but even between petitions, allow this to be a meditative, contemplative time. Don't feel the need to rush through the prayers. And, um, and that also means we want to be careful not to try to pack too much into the prayers because uh, there's more going on in the worship than, than these prayers as well. So we need to allow them to sort of have their place within the, the flow of the liturgy. And if they are expand too much, they can start to overtake certain bits. So um, just be, be conscious that this should be kind of a time of a meditative petition, meditative, it should be quite silent. Um, I would say it's important to remember that the petitions do not have to be all inclusive. You don't, if you don't have to include everything you're concerned about that's going on in the world or in people's lives or in the church or in the community. Uh, we have to trust that God is going to call us to pray for certain things and God is going to call other churches to pray for certain things. And in the body of Christ as a whole, across all the denominations, people are the appropriate people are going to pray for the appropriate issues. So just be conscious that we don't have to pray for every little, every single issue that, that comes into our mind. Uh, we are called to pray, um, we're called to pray for particular things. And so just give yourself freedom to, to sometimes it's hard to not pray for something that um, maybe we don't feel prayer, um, called to pray for. So I would say like four petitions, um, four major petitions. This can be like 400, 500 words. And try to tie the petitions together as best you can. Um, you can do this by maintaining an image that runs through those, those petitions. Um, it, it can maybe be lines from a hymn or uh, s scriptural lines that are familiar enough that people recognize where they're from that can tie through all those all those readings. They can run through all those readings. Uh, keep in mind your context um, in the in the liturgy. So, if, for example, the reading of Jesus dividing the loaves and fishes is the reading for that Sunday. Um, you may want to think about praying for the farmers who grow food and the hungry who need the food. And then you can maybe talk more metaphorically about hunger, that what are the things that people hunger for? They might hunger for companionship and love. And this is a way that you can maybe use a theme to tie through uh, the prayers of the people. Okay, and the fourth this is the, the outcome. What are you imagining God is going to do? What are you hoping that God is going to do? What change is desired? So you've named the issue, but how exactly do you want God to bring this about? And uh, we can be sort of specific about that as well. Um, what results do you expect from God answering these prayers? And try to be specific and tangible and measurable and relevant. Um, it can be a little intimidating, but it's uh, if God doesn't answer the prayer, how would we know? <laughs> in, a, in a sense, that's kind of what we're, what we're doing here. Uh, but that means that we also want to not pray overly simplistically. We want to pray in a deeper way. We want to pray maybe into the deeper social issue that's underneath the flashy news line. Uh, we want to pray into the root causes, not just the, the uh, symptoms that we see on the surface. Uh, we, 
So when we are praying, we might want to pray uh, pray for uh, insight into these issues. If we're praying for suffering, we might want to pray for a sick person to get well, but we might also want to pray for uh, patience in the midst of sickness or to pray for um, us to maybe learn something in the midst of suffering. These are things that we can we can also pray with with appropriate sensitivity as well. You know, we don't want to, um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, but, but we don't need to pray simplistically and obvious and too obviously. Uh, so the fifth piece is um, the conclusion of the, the prayers. Uh, sometimes this can be like a Trinitarian or Christ-centric um, conclusion. So we might say, in Jesus' name I pray. And, or we could say, through Christ our Lord, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. These are ways that the, the Book of Common Prayer often sort of wraps things up uh, in our prayer. The conclusion should maybe match the theme if you're using a theme for the prayers of the people, and it should be a it should match that. Um, you can use images that you have been using in the prayers to, as a part of that that theme. Um, you can. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can do this. And also remember that after the prayers of the people, we often, in the Eucharist anyway, we go into a time of confession and absolution. And so we want to end the prayer in a way that it leaves people lingering in a prayerful state so that they can enter into confession. So be aware of what's happening after you're done praying because then you can assist the liturgy by um, helping people enter into the next piece. Okay, so some general thoughts about the prayers of the people. Um, sometimes we have special days in the church. So there'd be like the International Day of the Leper, or there's a number of different kinds of uh, days that you, we might get um, a recommendation from the Primates World Relief that there is a day that they want us to recognize a particular issue. Um, and lots of diff different groups within the church will ask the same of us. Uh, there might also be secular um, days. So we might have a, uh, a day in the secular calendar that we're asked to remember certain issues uh, to bring awareness to these things. And it can be a little awkward for the those organizing the liturgy to, to deal with that in an overall way. So say, for example, we were given that such and such a day is the International Day of the Leper. Well, what the people who are organizing the day, what they often are hoping for is that we will find readings appropriate to lepers and we will preach on leprosy and issues surrounding leprosy and maybe take up a, a donation to, to go towards those causes and those are all good causes. Uh, but that can be very tricky for the person who's the, the, you know, the preacher or the, the priest. That can be very hard for them to organize all that because it, it, it can interrupt the liturgy. And the liturgy is using a, a lectionary that has a kind of flow to it. And so uh, there's a theme in the season or there's a, a theme in the readings or, or progressing through a particular book or something. And if all of a sudden we have a thematic day that interrupts all that, then it, it can, personally, I find it uh, difficult because I, I, I want to stick to the, the, the lectionary for the most part. I think that there's a reason the lectionary is there and I think the, the lectionary is trying to keep a, keep a theme going um, throughout. And so I find it hard to just interrupt everything and use different collects and use different readings and, and, and all of that to sort of recognize a particular day. Although I'm not trying to criticize anyone who does do that because Quite often we will do that for like a saint's day or something um, that happens to fall on a Sunday especially. So it's not that it's wrong to do that or anything, but it, 
it, it's tricky, especially if you get a lot of those days being thrown at you. But where an appropriate place is for those um, for those concerns to be brought forward is the prayers of the people. It's easy for someone who's leading the prayers of the people to say, and today is the uh, recognition of the International Day of the Leper, and we want to pray for um, for those who are um, suffering with leprosy and those who are trying to help them. And, and so we could even introduce that and then pray to God on behalf of the lepers. Um, it, I hope that makes sense. Um, so it's just to say that these these uh, good and important issues can sometimes not fit very comfortably in the liturgy, but they will be very appropriate to go into the prayers of the people. Um, when we are leading the intercessions, it's important to remember that this is know the piece that you're that the prayers are playing in the liturgy. So don't try to recreate another part of the liturgy. Uh, it's, it's actually not a primary place for confession, though that element is, is appropriate in the prayers at times. The prayers are not a second sermon, um, and they aren't even maybe necessarily Thanksgiving primarily, even though those can all be put in there. The second sermon can be a danger if there's something the, the person who's praying really wants to communicate to the congregation. Uh, it can sometimes overwhelm them to the point that they almost stop praying to God and they start, they want to read the congregation a story or something. And that sort of hijacks the liturgy and it, it kind of derails the flow of the liturgy because the sermon has already happened, right? So the, the job of the prayers of the people at this point is to approach God on behalf of the people. And if you start reading a story, then who are you talking to at that point? And what part of the liturgy, like what is the point of the part of the liturgy you're, you're enacting? Um, and these things are done with the best of intentions, but they can have the effect of derailing the liturgy from what's supposed to be happening at that point. Um, the prayers are not a time to share a social agenda or a political judgment. Uh, they're not a place to make announcements. So if someone has died and the congregation doesn't know that yet, then uh, you want to be careful to not sort of shock people with the news in the midst of the prayers with the news that this person has now died. Uh, you can announce that before you start praying, you could say, in the prayers today, we're going to be remembering so-and-so, and we just want to, um, in case you didn't know, this person has died, and that we want to pray for their family who's mourning right now and their friends. And so you can introduce it if, if it hasn't really, doesn't seem like it's been publicly announced, and we have permission to announce that. Um, so just remember, the, the place of the prayers is to bring the concerns of the world, bring the pain and the need and all of that to God. That's, that's the point of the prayers of the people. So beware of um, even sort of poems and stuff like that that are used in the prayers of the people. You want to be careful of that because it starts to look like you're um, talking to the congregation rather than talking to God. If it's a prayer that, it, or if it's a prayer that is also a poem, and it's actually addressed to God, then yeah, absolutely, go for that. Um, if it's uh, appropriate to the, to the theme of the day and, and everything. But um, if it's just sort of read for inspiration for the congregation, then that's actually a little more like the sermon. It can be a little, be a little bit of hijacking of the different part of the, different part of the liturgy. Um, there's a, a funny balance in the prayers, too, about being too general or being too specific. If you're too general, then people won't be able to connect to it. Um, but if you're too specific, people can't connect to it either. Um, and it can be... So just beware of that. Be aware of that balancing act between being too general and too specific. You want to be 
specific enough and general enough that most people can kind of find their place there. Um, Well, keep in mind your social and liturgical context. So if you are in an urban setting versus a rural setting, you're going to maybe shape your prayers a little bit differently, especially if you're in like uh, it's harvest time and you're rural, that's going to look a little bit different than if you're in an urban environment. So uh, be aware of those kinds of context differences. Uh, be aware of the liturgical season you're in. If you are in Advent, or in Easter or in Lent, the prayers should sort of take on that flavor. And within our book of alternative services, there's litanies that match those uh, match those seasons, which can be quite helpful. Um, and you can even take those prayers, those litanies from um, like in the book of alternative services, and just and modify them. Use them as your skeleton, and then modify them. Um, uh, is there a baptism happening at the church that day? That should find its place in there. Uh, is it, are we celebrating a saint's feast day? Uh, you might want to read up a little bit about that saint and, and make your, your prayers sort of match that day as well. Um, and be aware of the cycles of prayer that we use. So this is maybe one of the more awkward pieces of the prayers of the people. It can be really easy for using these cycles of prayer. They, they can just become names like reading out of the phone book uh, a lot of the time. So there, look for ways to make this a little more accessible for people. You might want to think about looking up the country look at what the concerns of the country are, look at what the news is in that country. Um, if you're looking up uh, a place and you find out that they're dealing with a famine or they're dealing with terrorist attacks or they're dealing with, you know, how comfortable is Christianity within that environment? If you're looking up a, a church in a, in a place where Christianity is being persecuted, you might want to make that a part of your, your prayers rather than just naming the country and naming the church that we're praying for. It can be really helpful to look up the clergy. Sometimes if you have that possible, if it's possible, you can even put a little map on the screen or put a map in the bulletin or a picture of the bishop. Uh, that All of that can make it a lot easier for people to connect to the, the cycles of prayer. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, in the cycles of prayer as well, beware of long and formal titles. This can be very distracting for people as well. So, for example, um, I would prefer to use the title Archbishop Greg rather than the Most Reverend Greg Kerr Wilson, Archbishop of Calgary and Metropolitan of Rupert's Land. Um, so, too many pieces of the title can become distracting, especially if you get too many of those types of uh, names within the prayers. So I would, I would shorten all that and say, let's pray for Archbishop Craig. Um, so similarly, when asked to pray for, quote, the Church of the Province of the Indian Ocean and the Most Reverend Ian Gerald James Ernest Archbishop, Province of In the Indian Ocean and Bishop of Maratiris. I don't even know if I pronounced that last word right. Uh, so I would, I would want to simplify all that because remember who's listening and how many of these words do they know. So I might say instead, we pray for uh, the churches of the islands of the Indian Ocean and their Archbishop Ian Ernest. It's a way of simplifying all those titles and even simplifying the geography so that we can relate to it a little bit better. Um, I just find it, it's very difficult to concentrate on things that you're not, you want to be helping people with the knowledge they have. They know islands in the Indian Ocean, they might connect to that rather than 
uh, a bunch of names that they don't necessarily know. Um, so that's just me, but you know, people might have a different opinion than I do. Um, again, we want to trust that the church as a whole across the world is praying and that they will be addressing things that we aren't addressing. So we don't have to feel the need to be super exhaustive with, with our, our prayers. Um, trust that the breadth of the church is going to cover the world. And we're praying for things other churches aren't praying for. They'll pray for things we aren't praying for. And we just have to trust each other uh, to, to do that. So we want to include in our prayers, and you can do this in a couple of different ways. You can start local, which is maybe better because people can relate to that, and then expand global. Or you can go start global and expand uh, or contract into the local. But generally, the issues we want to pray for are global issues, if there's things going on in the world, national issues, uh, local issues, wider church issues, like maybe we're praying for something for the national church or for the diocese, uh, congregational issues. So are in your congregation, are you praying for like maybe you have a building project or something happening? Uh, and individual issues, which might be those who are, who are sick or those who are grief stricken, that kind of thing. Um, some people think that to start local is maybe selfish, that we're thinking about ourselves first, but it can be a bit of kindness to the congregation to um, help them to sort of start praying with issues they know about and can relate to, and then expanding to places that they don't know about. Uh, it's just, um, anyway, it's a it's sort of a taste thing. It I don't think either of them is, is wrong, uh, but it can be hard for people to, if they're feeling like they're disengaging right off the bat because they can't relate to the issues that are being brought forward right away, uh, right out of the gate. Um, try to avoid repetitive phrases. Uh, it can be maybe a little bit distracting. Try to be clear, try to be sincere, try to be succinct in your prayers. Select a few images and just go deep with those as you sort of craft the prayers around those images. Um, the prayers should be more like a poem than an essay, if that makes sense. There should be a flow to them. Uh, it, rather than it just being a list. Also remember that to not always pray what's obvious. Uh, I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but remember that suffering is more than physical. It's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's social, and it's physical. So there's lots of different kinds of suffering that we should be being conscious of. And also be aware, of, as you're praying for different issues, to not create a us-them duality. Um, so if you're praying for those who are addicted, try not to say, and we pray for those poor people who are struggling with addictions, because You've just put the, the person with the addiction outside the community. And it, it doesn't allow the person who is struggling with an addiction to include themselves in the congregation. So it would almost be better to say, and for those of us who struggle with addiction, Lord, we pray that you would help, uh, get, help us gain freedom from that. Like include yourself um, as if those who are struggling are in the midst of you. Uh, of the congregation. And remember God's end goal as well. Uh, so this is maybe not easy for everyone to hear, but God's end goal is not human happiness in this life. So what does God really want to be happening in the world? What God wants to be happening is 
He wants people to come into relationship with him. And that means that whatever the circumstances are that we're dealing with, that sometimes the more important piece is our relationship with him rather than whatever the surface issue is. Uh, so beware of just praying the obvious. Look into the deeper reality that might be going on. Pray in accordance with Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name, right? So what does that mean? It means we pray in accordance with Jesus's character, Jesus's teaching, and Jesus's kingdom, God's ultimate will for the world. That's what it means to pray in line with Jesus's name. Um, ask yourself, what would Jesus be praying? What is Jesus praying about in this moment, in this particular issue? Uh, pray even for the process, not just the outcome. God seems to work through process. He works through growth over time. And it's important to pray for that as well. I remember someone praying over me that I would not suffer anything that doesn't bring me closer to God. It's a really wise prayer. Um, it, it assumes that God could use my suffering. Not that God caused it, but that God could use my suffering to bring me closer to him. I know all of this is really delicate, um, but just I think it's important for us to be aware of maybe not praying too simplistically and being aware of God's desires in the midst of our praying. Sometimes we need to pray counterintuitively too. Like Jesus does ask us to pray for our enemies. And maybe that's what we need to do once in a while, even if that's not going to be popular. So if there's, you know, for example, a terrorist attack, maybe we do need to pray for the people who did the attack. You know, and I think that's a very Christian thing for us to do, even if it's not politically popular. Uh, we have a mandate from Christ that to pray in a Christian way means to pray for our enemies and for those who hate us. So uh, keep, keep that in mind, to not to pray maybe counterintuitively sometimes. Um, be creative with your prayers. Maybe you want to collect a whole bunch of marbles or pebbles or something. And you want to hand it out to the congregation as a part of your prayers. And as people are holding on to that pebble, maybe your theme is that God is, is our rock. And maybe everyone holds on to that rock and brings it home as a reminder that God is our rock. But uh, there's something beautiful about holding on to that rock while, while praying under the theme that God is our rock. Uh, or maybe you want people to hold on to that rock and, and uh, that to you, Attach to that rock some intention, someone you're worried about, or maybe an anxiety. And then maybe at the end, you collect all those rocks in a basket and bring them up to the altar. Uh, maybe you want people, you want to hand out pieces of paper and have people write down something, that they, like a concern or worry, someone they're praying for, uh, someone they've fought with that they want forgiveness from or that they want to forgive. And they write that person down. That's collected and brought up to the altar. There's, uh, be creative. Don't just think about words. Think also about actions that people could maybe participate in. Um, ah, responses. Uh, responses are a little bit tricky. So in the VAS, sometimes they give a response without having an introduction. Uh, so a, a very common one is, Lord, hear our prayer. And so you've just had kind of a paragraph of, of um, bringing in a, a, an issue to God. And then you say, Lord, hear our prayer. And, and uh, people miss responding because there's no introduction. 
And so what I often do is I'll say, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. So that people know and they, they hear it repetitively so they know when to respond so they can add their voice and their intention to that prayer. Uh, I think that's quite important so that people don't feel like they're surprised. <laughs> so it's like, Lord, hear our, hear our prayer. And everyone's trying to just catch the last two words on the, on the response. So it's, it's helpful to have a little piece in there as an introduction to, uh, to their response. Uh, also be careful about making the response too complicated. Um, so, for example, I, I, I'm a big fan of Lord have mercy or Lord hear our prayer rather than something like uh, grant our supplication, our creator, sustainer and redeemer. It's like people are going to be having to like think that, like lock that into their minds and waiting for the time that you are, they're not even going to be hearing what you're saying because they're going to be trying to remember that whole phrase, unless it's printed in a bulletin or something. But I don't, um, I also don't think it's helpful for people to be fumbling with books or bulletins while they're trying to respond and pay attention to the prayers. I would say that the prayers should probably be no more than four or five minutes long. Uh, just remember that there's a, there's a, a whole liturgy that um, is uh, is taking place, and, and this is one piece of it. Um, and uh, so it should be maybe four petitions that are being addressed to God uh, with a concluding prayer as well. And there's lots of resources you can draw from. You can look to the, uh, and I'll put a bunch of links under this video. The Book of Alternative Services has litanies there. Um, the Book of Common Prayer has lots of beautiful um, beautiful prayers. You can even update the language if you want to, if you don't like the these and thous in there. Uh, there's lots of online resources and I'll put those in there too. And remember that they, uh, this is a good book with resources in it as well. It's more about leading the prayers and it is about uh, giving you specific things to use in your prayers. Um, but there's a neat little checklist at the back that is, is helpful in here. And I'll give you maybe a checklist that I might recommend uh, based on what they wrote. Um, so I'd say check the liturgical season, read the scripture used for that day, check the hymns in the thermon, ser sermon theme, identify global and national concerns, identify concerns of the broad worldwide church, identify issues of the local community. Um, are there people who are ill and who are known to the congregation who desire prayer? Has anyone died recently that's known to the congregation? Are there any concerns of the parish that need prayer? So is there a project that the parish is working on? Uh, use scripturally broad ways to address God. So explore the whole scriptural way of addressing God. Have you used imperative verbs? Have you asked God actually to do something? Have you referred to God directly? Are you talking to God and not just about God? Are you, rather than talking to the congregation, are you talking to God in your prayers? Uh, beware of repetitive phrases. Um, so anyway, I won't go into details. Uh, have you been careful about accuracy of us and, and them language, we language? in light of who's present, making sure that people are, are included, that the community is, is, has a wholeness to it. Um, do you have a, a clear, short, memorable congregational response, such, such as, Lord, hear our prayer? Um, do they know when to respond? Do you have a little introduction? So, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And is there uh, a suitable ending, a conclusion that ties everything up thematically and also sort of allows the prayerful space to remain as we enter into the next piece of the liturgy. Uh, so I hope that's helpful for those of you who are leading the prayers of the people. Um, I know that I threw a lot out there at you, and uh, I, but I do hope this is helpful as we um, help our congregations pray. God bless you.